Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Forward Obsessed. Today, our guest, Larry Janeski, founder of Basement Systems and about 36 other companies. Larry is incredible. He takes us through the lessons of learning, life, leadership, how he conquered the Baja 1000 by his motto, never give up. He's a book writer, an author, a movie maker on YouTube, uh, chronicling his journey through the Baja 1000, one of the most incredible, hard dirt bike journeys that you could take through the desert. I think you guys are gonna love this one. Pete and I sure did. Let us know what you think in the comments. Be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're watching. And thank you, and stay Forward Obsessed. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Forward Obsessed. I'm your co-host, David Salinas, and to my right... Pete Sana, how are you? Today we have an incredible entrepreneur, an accomplished patent holder, author, multi-time entrepreneur, Larry Janeski. Larry, it's a pleasure to have you today. Welcome to New Haven and to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Larry, what we like to do when we start off is we go back to the early years. Uh, typically, there's a, a thread uh, in the in your childhood or in everyone's childhood that sort of walks them into entrepreneurship. And we've done a little bit of digging on you. We see that there is a thread there. So, walk us back. Where did it, where, where first of all, where are you from? And uh, take us a little bit into your childhood and how you got to uh, where you are today. Yeah, you know that that's a great place to start with people because uh, I think that. Uh, your childhood cements certain parts of your identity in there that stay with you forever. So, um, yeah, I, I grew up in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, and, uh, you know, second floor of a three-family house. Um, I was uh, second of three boys, and then uh, much later had uh, they had a, a, a girl. I had a sister. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, we didn't have any money, you know, I mean, my story is not unique, you know, I, and I, and I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know, n now, but the reality is, um, you know, we, we, we struggled, you know, and my, uh, parents got divorced when I was, uh, first grade and, uh, uh, my mother got remarried and, uh, my stepfather, he, he was a good guy, but he was, uh, an alcoholic, you know, and, uh, you know, not a, um, obvious raging alcoholic but he he drank like you know five nights a week and he'd be you know at the bar and my mother wouldn't know when he was coming home and she would try to keep dinner you know warm for him and he'd come home and not be grateful for it and they'd start fighting and uh but um you know so as a result you know he jumped job to job and we never had any money and my mother you know she worked you know two three jobs and did things she didn't like and just to, you know, put food on the table. So I saw sort of both two sides, right? It was sort of um, the problem and the solution, you know, right there. So, um, you know, I, I realized when I was young, in order to have things that I wanted, um, I had to go get it myself. You know, the hustle. You know, no, I should back up and say, you know, God put in me, uh, cause I have an older brother who is, you know, completely the opposite. He's a, he's a mess right now. And, you know, um, but God put in me ambition, right. And, and, and the ability to, you know, go after what I want. And I, I think that that is a talent, right. And, um, so you combine that with my experience, okay. That, Hey, if you want something, you got to go get it yourself. You know, um, I, I, I saw when I was eight years old, I, I, comic book ad sell burpee seeds right buy them for x dollars a box sell them for x bucks a pack so i go door to door hey do you want to buy some seeds and people bought seeds and i in bridgeport it, it, it yeah and uh you know and and maybe they bought them just because i was a you know cute kid and the, you know and but and i reordered and reordered and you know um learned that Hey, I can make money on my own. So that's that's a um, an early lesson that I learned that I try to teach to my son. And you know, we we had plenty of money when he was eight years old, but we went to Sam's Club or and bought batteries 
uh, A battery, double A, triple A, you know, C, D, nine volt, you know, whatever. And um, we, I made, I made him go door to door, you know, and I, I, I stopped at the curb, made him walk up to the door, and he was so shy, he's so introverted that he made a sign, and it said, "Hey, I'm Tanner. I'm selling batteries. They're, um, they're a little cheaper than you can buy them in the store, right? A, a retail store." And, you know, I have these batteries and these are the prices. And we'd go door to door and he would, you know, buy low, sell high, right? Learn this, right? Because you see these, you know, uh, I, I read a quote from some billionaire, I forget who it was, that said, I, I, uh, I could give my um, children everything except desperation. And for that, I apologize. <laughs> you know? Wow. So... Um, but, you know, those, that was my early childhood. I had paper routes, you know, and bought the neighboring paper, paper boy out and then another paper boy out. And I was delivering 140 papers a day. And, and for yeah. the audience that doesn't know, you bought your first paper out when you were 13 when you bought a paper out. Like, yeah. that's a, kind of an interesting thing to like, I'm going to buy a paper out. Like, what, where'd that come from? I actually want to back it up because I think the audience needs to understand. So I moved, I'm from New York City and I grew up in Queens, poor as well, didn't come from much. I read your story. I grew up in a two-bedroom apartment as well with five people. I think you had six. Mm-hmm. Um, but my I, when I moved to Connecticut, I moved to Bridgeport, and I didn't know what Bridgeport was. That was in 1999. Bridgeport was the number one murder per capita city in the United States of America. It was very. It was a bankrupted city. It was impoverished. So you grew up in in one of the worst cities in America. Poor. Well, thank God. Because you, you learn. I just give it a little color for the audience. Yeah, here. no, you're no. That that's great. Um, but you know, we had like you know, I'd play football on the green with my with my friends, right? And you had um, there was a lot of Italians in my neighborhood, and to to this day, I'm not Italian at all, but to this day, I identify as one. <laughs> you know, but um, but there was the Puerto Ricans down the street, right? Just after you know, a couple blocks away, it was like a big Puerto Rican area. So we would play them in football, right? And a lot of them were in my school, right? Then you had, you know, uh, Polish people and you had, you know, Jamaicans over here and you had, and I learned to get along with this wide variety of people, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, delivering papers to this 78 year old, you know, Czechoslovakian immigrant lady, you know, and, you know, and then, you know, and then there's the guys that are going to kick your ass, you know, and you had to learn how to deal with all this stuff. Wonderful you know? life. Yeah. And, and I grew up the same way. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I also just, it's funny, um, in reading a little bit about you, I re- I, I really resonate, a lot of your life resonated with me and what you were just talking about. Just this morning, I was talking to my 14 year old daughter. I got her into se- selling sneakers. I started hustling when I was a young kid in fifth grade. I was selling milks. I was doing everything. Um, and now I got her selling sneakers and I'm trying to teach her. And yesterday I said to her, I, I just, I just landed this pair of sneakers the other day. And I said, here, I don't love them. I said, you want to sell them? And she said, okay. She said, how much should I sell them for? I said, eh, 280. I said, start at 300 with the, you know, she goes on TikTok and she posted for all her friends and all this stuff. Not quite door knocking, but, um, that's the modern day door knocking. Yeah. But this morning, the for you page is the new, is the new streets. <laughs> so this, so this morning she, I, I said, uh, did you get any bites? You know, she started last night and she goes, yeah, I sold them. I said, for how much? She said, 230 bucks. I said, how did we get there? She said, well, I owed my friend 20 bucks. I said, but that's 250. And I said, why are you making your problems my problems? <laughs> and she goes, she goes, what do you mean? I said, you owed them 20 bucks. I said, they're my sneakers. I told you to sell them for 280. And uh, I didn't even tell you what your commission is. I said, so you're doing some math behind the scenes I don't know about. And then she goes, well... He immediately said two thirty. I said, "So you dropped from three hundred to two to two thirty? She goes, "No." Well, I said two thirty five, and I was like, "What?" And we just and it. The point of the story is that the lesson that came out of that was how to do quick math. I wound up teaching her quick math: one percent discounts, five percent discounts, ten percent discounts. How to do it in your head so that you can actually effectively negotiate. And uh, so I appreciate. Sorry. Yep. Hello. Thank you. Put uh, it's silent, but you actually turn the volume on. If you remember, well, so where do you want to pick us back up from? I'll just I'll jump right in. Yeah. So, uh, so the 
you know, the moral of the story is just being able to teach your kids and, you know, whether it's knocking on doors and getting uncomfortable or anything like that, I really respect that. And, uh, it, it's near and dear to my heart as, as, as early as just a few hours ago when I dropped her off to school. I love the battery story. And I'm curious if I was to talk to Tanner today, what would he say about the battery story and how that has gone on to sort of shape who he's become as an adult? Yeah, well, he's in, he's an introvert, and uh, he, but he's um, he's pretty incredible. You know, he's twenty seven years old, and uh, he 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 had his own photography business, uh, fine art photography. Uh, he he did that, and when our house burned down, he lost all his stuff. But he oh, thought yeah. this is a good pivot point to change because you know that wasn't what he's going to do for the rest of his life. And then he was a salesman for us, and he was a top salesman. Uh, selling home energy conservation services uh, for six months. Then he announced, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then he has developed, even uh, at this young age, he's developed two blockbuster products. He's developed awesome. the most um, efficient, high-performance dehumidifier in the world. And we sell 20,000 of these things a year. Is it the Sanadry? The, the Sanadry Sedona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I have that in my basement <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from and, you guys. Uh, so he he beat, you know, all the engineers at their own game, you know, and he developed 60 prototypes and he's a science and math guy, right? And he just dug in for two years and come out with this product. And then he jumped in and developed uh, the uh, best air purifier in the world. And we're now, you know, marketing that. It's called the Aspen uh, air purifier. And uh, and now he's working. I just, just got off the phone with him. Uh, he's He moved to Utah and he's developing um, a system to um, have basically not net zero houses, but zero energy use houses, okay, for heating, cooling, uh, energy storage and uh it, it's just incredible i mean so he he's going he's shooting for the moon you know and uh so what's I, the secret how did, what's different about the way that you grew up with your mom working all those jobs and and your stepfather who had his 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 demons um what's different about the way you're you raised your your do you have what how many kids do you have i have three of from my first marriage and two at home right now, an eight year old and a 16 year old. Yeah. So five total. So what's your, cause I think it's important. Entrepreneurs quite often, I have three kids. Pete has one. Um, you know, it's a big part of your life when you st you got a baby, which is your company or your companies in your case, in, in many cases, and then you have your children and like, so what's the, what's the, what's the science behind it? I know you wrote a book about trying to challenge your doing some challenges with your son and stuff, but you ever... Well, I, I think that with, with kids, you, you, you can't fight who God made them to be, right? Um, you know, thank God everybody in the world is not like me, mm. okay? Because I'm not a good caregiver, you know, um, when somebody's sick, you know? Um, you know, I think with, with strengths come corresponding weaknesses, and you got to run in the direction of your strengths, and you can't expect everybody to be the same. And so, you know, if everyone was like me, no one would work for me, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, so your kids, you have to recognize who, you know, who they really are. I mean, my other kids, I wouldn't ever try to make them like Tanner and vice versa, right? So, uh, in fact, Tanner and, and Chloe, the, the, the next one in line— you know, really don't have much in common. They don't talk much, you know, they don't, you know, in fact, for, and, and many of the times they didn't even get along, but because they just didn't understand each other. Right. Um, but, um, you know, in, in my son's case, um, I think if there's any habit I bestowed upon him is the, you know, um, listening to audio books in your car, right. And becoming a rabid learner. Right. Um, we would, just me and him, we'd be in the in the truck a lot together because we would uh, be riding motorcycles uh, since he was five years old, and um, you know, twice a week, and we loved it. We did that together for years. But we would listen to audiobooks in the car, and he would understand, hey, I can learn anything. And I s I sent him to one of the best uh, private high schools, and that there is, and 
they were really disappointed to find out that he was the only one in the class not going to college. Just like me, I didn't go to college. I was going to bring that up. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the way things are today, you, you, you know, I consider myself one of the smartest guys in any room. Um, and you can learn anything you want. And I, I think you're better off not going to college. That's my opinion. You know, uh, you're not, you're going to learn what you want to learn, not what other people want to teach you. Uh, what they think you should learn. Uh, and what you should learn is context dependent. It depends on where you want to go, right? You got to have goals, right? And if you have goals and you know, and they're, they're aligned with who you really are, you know, it's not going to feel like work and you're going to learn the right things that to take you toward that goal. I love that conversation. Uh, just yes, two days ago, I saw uh, a tweet from Mark Andreessen. Uh, he was the founder of Netscape. You know who he is? Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, and I think the problem with college is is not just what it what it is and how long it takes and so on and so forth. The, one of the problems is the cost of it and the return on investment is not there anymore. He said that in ten years from now, a flat screen TV of the largest size will be a hundred dollars and dollars for a college dollars for a college education. So a million dollars for a college education. I just paid. I mean, I I was lucky and refied my my loans at two and a half percent when I graduated in, uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, so I didn't care to pay off my loans until a couple of years ago, but I mean, it's ridiculous now. And I agree with you. Well, it depends what you want to study. You know, you're not going to be a surgeon with a home study course, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to go for some formal training, uh, for, for different things, but for being an entrepreneur or just, you know, all around being successful, you know, in, in, in life, you know, you don't need to go to college. Um, on the audio books, I'm curious, what speed do you listen at? Um, 1.2, you know, same. Yeah. Because, you know, and the funny thing is I don't like to listen to audio books unless I'm near my, one of my journals. I got to write things down because, you know, if I hear something great, I know I'm going to forget it. You know, I got to write it down. Same way. Yeah, this is this is my prep for today. Getting ready for you. So. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've given you my book, The Highest Calling, and uh, with it comes shrink wrapped with it. There's a, a beautiful journal that comes with it, and uh, you know, I talk about journaling in the fable in the in the book, and uh, so I'm a big journaler. I write down you know anything of value that uh, that that is there. I go back and read it later. Um, and I also have a blog called thinkdaily.com that uh, I've been writing, uh, think daily and think daily for business people, two short messages. Sometimes they are three paragraphs, sometimes they are one sentence, but, uh, every weekday morning for 13 and a half years, I haven't missed. And I've got, um, about 20,000 people that get think daily. Um, so I, I, I never try to sell my, you know, anybody, anything, and I never share their email addresses. Um, I'm not trying to monetize anything. I'm just trying to put it out in the world. I believe in, you know, karma, right? That you, you know, what comes around goes around, right? Um, and so uh, because of my blog, I've gotten a lot of opportunities. People know me. They know how I think. They they, they know they, you know, they can trust me. And uh, they, you know, opportunities fall in my lap. Mm -hmm. What do you think that happens? Why does opportunities fall on your lap? Because they trust well, you? Because Yeah, I mean, your reputation, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have credibility, you have trust, um, you know, and uh, and people know you, right? They don't have to spend a lot of time if you're going to do, you know, get together with somebody uh, in some sort of partnership or, or you know, they're going to work for you or do business with you, be a customer or whatever. They don't have to, you know, spend time uh, researching your intentions and, your abilities and, and so forth. They, they know you already. So things are, are pretty quick. Yeah. I, I often say opportunities come to, to my, to me often because I'm, because I'm off, I, I make it very evident that I'm looking for opportunities. Everybody knows that I'm going to get it done. If you give it to me, I'm going to, I'm going to quickly assess it and I'm going to be able to sort of put it through its pathways. I feel like you have to be real intentional, well, intentional about serendipity, right? I say purposeful serendipity as a, you know, if you want it to come to you, 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 you do have to do some work. I think that's important for entrepreneurs to know. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, in the beginning, um, when you're first starting out your career, you, you don't have much to give, you know, and uh, all you got is, you know, develop your character um, and help other people, you know, uh, give, you know, do everything you can to help, 
help others. And uh, then they say, oh, you're a person I'd like to, you know, to work with. And you build your capabilities. You you're, you uh, keep learning. You build skills and you build a network and you build, you know, a resource pool. And, uh, and you know, and life expands, right? Bigger and bigger things come your way and you wind up doing bigger and bigger things and, and a lot easier in less effort than it used to take, you know, when at the at the beginning of your career. So I, I, I do believe in long wave patterns and, um, uh, you know, life is a long game. You know, you got to take care of your relationships, take care of your health, um, you know, keep learning. And, um, you know, I, I'm not here for, you know, uh, short term uh where, hey, let me just make enough money that I don't have to worry anymore and, and I'm done. Um, you know, I'm here to make, give my gift, if you will, you know, make a contribution, um, you know, to, to the world. And I think we all need to do that. Um, so let's move you, let's move the, the conversation along because I know you didn't make them, we, didn't, we know you didn't make the money from the burpee seats. By the way, we should put an affiliate link because burpees is still selling or direct and still doing that, that, that uh, seat for sale piece. Um, but you did really hit on basement systems. That's where it all sort of, that's the aha moment. I know, Pete, you wanted to dive into that piece, right? 100%. Yeah. And also as a customer, I'm really happy with my basement because of, because of you and what you guys have built. But I want to unpack something that you said earlier. Um, I'm getting a, a sense of spirituality and in, in sort of how you think about things. And I want to unpack that in a second. But you said God put ambition in you. And the question I want to ask you is, you've helped a lot of people build very successful lives, right? The, the work that you've done, not just with your employees, but with contractors and other small business owners, many people over the years have thrived because of the work that you've done. And the question I want to ask you as someone who's employed a number of people, inspired a number of people, clearly over 20,000 are tuning into your daily um, content, you've became a great content marketer in, in many ways, and you've been heralded that. How do you cultivate ambition in other people? You said God put it in you, but for those that maybe God didn't put it in or whatever you believe in, how do you cultivate ambition? Yeah, I mean, th there could be uh, dormant um, faculties in somebody that have not been ignited, right? And um, so... Like when I was a paper boy, I <clears throat> delivered papers in uh, uh, neighborhoods with two, three family houses. And uh, and then, you know, the, the edge of my paper route got into the neighborhood where there's single family houses, right? And I remember when I was maybe, I don't know, first grade, I went over my friend uh, Billy's house and he had a single family house. It was a little Cape Cod, but it's still, to me, it was like amazing, right? Single family house. Wow. You own this. Oh, wow. And run upstairs and I piss anybody off. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, and, and it was Decker. He had like shag carpet. Wow. You know, I never forget. It was dark brown shag carpet, but it was like, it was cool, man. Because apartments, you know, rental houses didn't have shag carpet. You know, it was, it was the 70s, you know. But um, I was like, wow, I, I, I want to know more about this, you know. So I think by uh and also you know when i got into basement waterproofing um i was you know doing sales and you know in you know like three houses a day and seeing you know houses in greenwich and stanford and darien and like oh wow you know people have this stuff you know people live like this and then i was curious to know what does this guy do you know um not because it was a creature. hedge fund <laughs> right yeah you know, yeah um but um, anyway, I think that ambition can be ignited by what you learn, who you meet, or what you're exposed to, right? So, you know, be careful. Just like, you know, they say, you know, you're the, you're the average of our five closest friends. And, you know, if you hang around with bad kids, you know, you're going to become a bad kid. I mean, it's probably going to happen, you know. So you really got to be very careful on the environments and the people and the, the conversation that's happening around you and, and go away from the negative, go toward the positive and the aspirational, you know, and people who are making something of themselves because, you know, you're, you're going to pick that up. So, but, you know, for some people, you know, look, being an entrepreneur, a business owner is a big responsibility and it's a heavy load at, at times uh, before you learn how to do it. Uh, I mean, I'm doing more than ever today. I have 35 companies in 25 states, and it's easier than ever for me, you know. 
uh, because I've learned how to do it and I've built the resources and, and so forth. But uh, it's not for everybody and that's okay. But, you know, do your very best to be exposed to, uh, you know, inspirational people doing inspirational things and, and, you know, see what that will ignite in you. Not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, right? Some people just want to be the best at something or we're just really good at something or maybe it's sports or maybe it's, you know, um, you know, some, some art or some, you know, some calling that, uh, that they feel, Hey, I love to do this. Speaking of a calling that that's a great transition to where David was going, which is like, so now at 18, you became a carpenter, right? You're pretty good with your hands and, and your head uh, clearly, and you are doing a job and you realize that you can't sell this place because there's just water damage in the basement. If my, if my memory suits me correctly, right? Is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think college was never talked about in my family and you know it's like where are you going to work right go, go get a job and i had plenty of jobs in high school you know steakhouse uh, retail u-haul you know and um so i went to bullard haven's technical high school in, in bridgeport and i was in carpentry class and so you know okay i'm going to be a carpenter right and and it wasn't like i had much of a choice right okay uh, but it's okay because you know i i wanted to do that so um i got a job working at a kitchen and bath remodeling place and the guy just screamed at me the whole time and disrespected everybody and he was a jackass but um a month later he fired me because i wanted to bang nails and he wanted me to clean up the you know the yard and um so we disagreed on that so i went i went home and i put an ad in the paper that i was delivering a few years earlier carpentry called larry no job too small so here's the thing um you got to believe in yourself you know um so a, a piece of the puzzle that I missed is I, I joined Boy Scouts and I loved it. I was, it was like a format where I could advance in the ranks, right? I could, you know, and get more and more merit badges, right? And, and uh, you know, learn to be a leader. Of course, you know, you're not great at it, but you're exposed to it. And uh, I became, you know, an Eagle Scout with, you know, um, I, I did really well. And it taught me that I could learn stuff. Right. Don't don't shy away from something just because you don't know it. And so many people do that. They say, well, I don't know anything about finance or I don't know anything about interest rates or I don't even know anything about, you know, uh, software or how to get this done or how to talk to people or negotiations. So they, they never try. Right. And they they start developing this small self-image. This is who I am. This is, you know, what I'm good at. I'll stay in my lane and I won't venture out. Right. Um, but I learned to be uncomfortable and that's really important. All growth lives lies outside your comfort zone. You know, by definition, if you want different results, you've got to be a different person, right? If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get what you got. Right. So, um, so you got to venture out and try new things and take on new things. Um, and, um, getting all these different merit badges taught me that, right. What do I know anything about, you know, uh, you know, uh, salesmanship, right. As, as a 15 year old, then I'll go for that merit badge. You know, what do I know about environmental science? I, I'll go for that, you know? And, uh, so when carpentry call Larry, no job too small, you're 17 years old. People call and say, I want a new bay window. I never put no bay window in. <laughs> I, I don't know where to buy a bay window. Um, and you say, okay, Right. And you go look at it and you take measurements and then you go see the guy at the lumber yard and you say, hey, man, <laughs> where, tell me about this bay window thing. Do you, What's do you a bay window? Them, <laughs> um, you know, how much you are they? Too, right? Yeah, it was, there was no Internet. So it was way harder. Right? No YouTube. Yeah. So I'd go back and give them a price and, you know, they give me the job. Right. And, um, you know, sometimes it was fix a porch railing, you know, I charge 80 bucks, you know, to fix a wiggly railing or something, you know. But um, then one day a guy calls, I'm 18. He says, can you build a house for me? I said, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could build a house. Um, but I'm 18. So, like, if that's a problem, let me know. And there's a long silence on the phone as the guy weighed his options. And it turns out it was a building boom and all the real carpenters were busy. You know, you read this book, that Malcolm Gladwell book. Uh, a tipping Point? Tipping Point. 
where you know uh, Gates and and Jobs and these the guys, pirates of Silicon Valley, th- they were doing the right thing at the right time. So here I was, eighteen years old, nineteen eighty four, building boom in Connecticut, and all the real carpenters are busy, and I'm a new carpenter. So the guy says, okay. So we met at a Denny's. He spreads the blueprints out on the table. Uh, my buddies told me charge a dollar sixty a square foot for framing, so I did, and I got the job. And in six weeks, I framed roofs, sided, and put the windows and doors and and decks onto this house. And we showed up in the morning and we stayed till dark. It was summer, and my friend who was seventeen years old, I was eighteen, and my brother who was fourteen years old, we were the crew, right? Love and, it. And all the the real builders would drive by, you know, go. Oh, you used to walk. Has the <laughs> you know. They're looking at how we're doing things like, what the hell? But we did it. We got it done. And then the, 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 the house on the left side said, hey, can you build mine? And the one on the right side, hey, can you build mine? So now you're a home builder, right? Now I'm a home builder. And, and then I realized I'm not making any money, really. Um, I mean, I guess I was, according, you know, many of my friends were still, you know, in college or, you know, uh, I, I was doing okay. Your friends were folding t-shirts at retail stores and you're building houses. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So the learning curve, right? You pay your dues, right? And then I was buying lots and getting builders mortgages at a young age and spec building. And um, so everything you learn as a young person, you can lever, you know, if you don't jump horses. Now, a lot of people, unfortunately, don't find their calling early, right? They start something and they say, no, this isn't what I want to do. You got six years invested and you jump horses to another industry. You're a newcomer again, right? Um, and you're a rookie and, and now you're starting all over again. For me, I've been in the building industry and fix houses, building them and fixing them my whole life, right? And, and I've, uh, you know, I've, I've done the steep learning curve years and now, Things are very easy if I get into something new in that same, you know, industry. Uh, so, um, yeah, the last house I built had a leaking wall crack and, you know, I had to figure out how to fix the foundation wall crack and I couldn't build any more houses because they stopped selling. The building bubble had burst. And um, that's how I decided, well, I- I'm going to be a basement waterproofing contractor. It seems like, you know, I could make my mark here. I love that. Before I pivot, and I'm sure, David, I, I see the gears turning in your head. I want to ask a question about fear because I, what I've heard from some of the audience that's reached out to us and about the show is a lot of people say, you have a lot of people on here that seem to be fearless. You know, building a house at 18 years old, shit, building a house at 40 years old, you know, with, with a lot of life experience, it sounds like an overwhelming task. When you were getting these big asks, I mean, clearly you're the kind of guy that's impeccable with his word, right? You talk about reputation a lot, even in this conversation today you had to have felt some sense of fear, like, oh my God, this is way out of my comfort zone. And like, how do you work through that fear as an entrepreneur, as, as just a human? Because I think the audience can get a lot of value from just how you unpack that. Yeah, that's an important question. Uh, well, um, you know, sometimes fear comes from um, you're afraid to be embarrassed or not know what you're doing. Okay. And I wasn't the kind of guy who would go in, like, be brash and brazen and talk a big game. You know, I I was quiet. I was respectful, polite. Okay. All right. I understand. Let me ask you questions. Right. And then I go back and do my homework and come back with an answer. Um, Was I taking a chance that I'd screw something up? Yeah. Did I screw things up sometimes? Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I gave it my absolute best and I believe that if anybody could do it, I could do it too. Like no one's better than me. And, um, maybe they know more than me They're They have more experience than me, but they're not better than me. So if they can do it, I can do it. I just need to know what they know. Right. And I'll put in the work and I'll put in the effort. And I believe that I would work hard and I would give it, you know, my best. I was lacking information because, you know, we didn't have the internet then. But, you know, I, I thought if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail doing my absolute best and people aren't going to crucify me for it. They're going to say, uh, this sucks. Well, you know, let's see how we can fix it together. They're not going to, you know, treat me like a criminal, right? Because I, I did my best and I showed up and I, you know, 
um, had the right intention. Um, so, you know, if you have the right intention and you're willing to do the work, you know, don't fear l- embarrassment or, you know, uh, that you, you don't know what you're doing, you know, just be honest, tell the truth and, you know, uh, and show up with the right intentions. Um, the other thing is that sometimes fear comes from people feeling they have something to lose. And I had nothing to lose. I was busted, right? Nobody in my family ever, you know, really did well, right? Um, and so I had nothing to lose. I mean, I, I, I was going for it. I, I, I had this sense when I was young that I am going to do something special one day, that I'm going to be somebody. And, um, and I was going to earn it, right? Um, and we don't have anything to lose. Like people, you know, the only thing you have to lose is the opportunity, right? You, you know, you're never going to be 23 years old again. I'm never going to be 58 years old again. You know, um, on my uh, nightstand or, or my uh, vanity, I have a giant jar of marbles. And I put that jar there when I was uh, about 52 uh, years old. I'm 58 now. And I filled it with marbles, one marble for every year I would live. And I'm going to live to be 100. And um, so there's, you know, for, for every week I would live. Sorry, every week. Every week. So every weekend I take a marble out of the jar. Now, I happen to get the right size jar. It was full to the top. And um, the marbles, every week I take a marble out and I discard it and the space in the jar reminds me of how much time has gone at least since I started that and and the, the marbles that remain remind me of you know how much time I have left and that it's finite right um and so I I have a sense of urgency right if if you want to do something you need to do it now right um your health you know I mean you know, I, I ride motocross, right? And it's it's great for your body, but it can it can be <laughs> tough on your body, right? And I had my knee replaced just over two years ago. And like, look, you're not going to be able to do all the things. You're not going to have the energy. You now, you could definitely put your finger on the scale in your favor, okay? By eating right, sleep right, move right, okay? All of those things. But in the end... We're all going to die. That's guaranteed. Okay. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we're, it's going to happen. Okay. So this is your shot, right? So the only thing you have to lose is you lose your shot because you were afraid, right? So take your shot. What's the worst that can happen? You win or you learn, right? You win or you learn. That's it. There's no lose. If you keep going, if you stop, if you quit while you're down, you're a loser, right? But if you keep going while you're down, you're learning and you are better equipped to succeed uh, tomorrow. Um, you know, fear gives the wrong advice every time. Okay, so we need to recognize it, understand why it's there. And, um, you know, we have fear because, you know, through thousands and thousands of years of human evolution, you know, we feared being cast out of the group, right? Because we couldn't live alone. Like, you know, we had to grow our food, hunt our food, you know, skin it, cook it, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we couldn't do that alone. So we inherently fear being cast out of the group, you know? I, I often say, I think fear and negativity is easy. I think it's, it's a, uh, I just had a conversation with another entrepreneur the other day. I'm on the board of his company and... And he just always, no matter what happens, no matter the, where the conversation goes, his first reaction is often fear or the negative. And I said to him, you do that every single time. And he goes, well, that's just the way I am. I said, but the problem with that is that fear and negativity is easy. So it's, it's easy to know the worst thing that's going to happen, the no, the failure, and so on and so forth. The problem that we run into as people 
is Ed, the problem that I that I that I I am concerned about is that you burn your good calories. You know how they say something. You know, like get the important stuff done as soon as you wake up, right in the morning. If you use those calories to focus to 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 work on to explain the fear or to go into all the negative things that can happen, now the good calories, the good energy is gone, and now you start to work on, and now you want to look at the positive side, and you don't have the energy for that. And I feel like uh, it's the downfall for entrepreneurs. I'm curious how, in a world of, you work in a very sticky environment, uh, uh, contractors, they're different, it's, it's a different type of entrepreneur. At least in my experience, my father was a contractor, he was a carpenter, he used to do bathrooms and kitchens like you grew up. And just being around the trades, I worked in plumbing, I worked for an electrician, I did demo for my father. Um, those guys tend to be unlike white collar entrepreneurs, right? How do you like maneuver and teach those habits? Because I know part of what you do now uh, in Contractor Nation is is train people and provide uh, programming. How do you teach people to not focus on fear, to not work in the negative, to not have those those things that you clearly don't have today? Well, let, let me just back up a little half a step and 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 say something here. And I, I think this could be maybe the most important thing that I say in this podcast. You, you started to say in a world where um, you don't have to live in this world as other people perceive it or as the popular culture would present it. You need to create your own world because there's so many things to pay attention in, to in this world. There's, there's far more content, news and media and things to learn and podcasts and books and uh, people and voices to listen to through all the channels than you could, I mean, in a million lifetimes, right? You couldn't pay attention to everything. So don't pay attention to what everyone else is paying attention to. If if you want to be average, do that. That's what everyone else does. I bet your your associate who's negative watches the news, right? So the news is obviously the worst thing. They're just negative fear peddlers and don't you know, I, I would say don't don't watch the news at all. Um so you create the world that you live in by what you pay attention to. And that's the master skill of the 21st century is the ability to focus your attention. And so if you pay attention to the positive things, the constructive things, the voices of value that match with your uh, worthy goal, your big goals, right? Um, you are going to live in a world that's very different than the world that everyone else, you know, lives in. Um, so... That, that, that's really, really important, you know? And so as far as fear and neg being negative, if you're conditioned to be fearful and negative, I mean, that's going to be your first response, right? I'm not conditioned that way. I, I don't, I don't think negatively. I don't fear very much at all. Um, I think about solutions and, uh, being constructive and moving forward and, you know, I'm not dead yet. You know, I'm going to die one day, but not today. All right, here I go. Right. Um, so that's the, the quicker that we can understand that the ability to focus your attention and not pay attention to, um, anything that produces fear and anxiety and negativity and powerlessness. Um, it, it, the better. You will make so much more progress in life. And that's why, you know, college, you don't have control of what that professor is going to say to you. Yeah. You know, we raise our kids for, you know, 18 years. We do our very best. And then we send them off to some school. Oh, what school do you want to go to, honey? And we send them off to some school and somebody's going to teach them and they figure, well, my parents sent me. I better, you know, that these people are right. And then we listen to people who are not successful and maybe negative and maybe political and indoctrinating our kids. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, you know? Yeah. But anyway. No, no, no. I, I think you bring up good points. I think it's easy. The reason why I brought it up is because I think it's easy for guys like you and I um, 
to be the way we are because like I always, when Pete and I became partners 17 years ago, 18 years ago, we became friends. I told him, I don't fear anything because I've been to the bottom, right? I grew up on the bottom. So I know now where I am today, no matter what level I'm at, I'm, I have that experience and everything that I've learned all the way up. So if I lose it all, now I'm starting from the bottom with all that experience. So I know I can get right back up on my feet. I know how to hustle. I know I could sell anything. I could, I could move any business. I could, I could create value for someone that'll get me back up on my feet to get off the bottom quickly. But so many people have never seen that like you and I have seen. So it's hard to get them to think differently. So I'm, that's why I'm always interested well, in like, what's the positioning? So, you know, to, to that point, okay, we talk about the bottom, right? So you say, all right, if I, if, if I fell down, or I got back to the bottom, I know I can survive because I've been there before and, and I'm, I'll be good. And, but the bottom and the top r refers to, you know, financial, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, comparisons and, you know, your wealth and, and, you know, no, so for me, for, for me, it's pain. Okay. But when, when you really, and this is where I am, and it takes a long time to learn this, you know, it's young people hearing what I'm about to say, they're going to say, oh, that's hooey, you know, um, uh, or they'll say easy for you to say you made it. Okay. But the purpose to say that, but <laughs> yeah, that, that, that really triggers me. The purpose of this journey, um, especially entrepreneurship, right, is to see not what you can get, but who you can become, right? Um, it's like, look, we're not taking anything with us, right? When you die, you ain't taking it with you, okay? So this is all temporary. And so in in the process of solving all these problems and the process of figuring all this out and the process of stepping out of my comfort zone over and over and over and over again, who have I become in the process, right? And that's why I don't fear, you know, losing money. Would it, you know, I prefer not to, okay? And yes, um, how good of a business person you are it, is reflected on your um, P and L. You know, I would say long term. I mean, you you know you you, you got to uh, pay the price for a lot of years before you get there. But really, it's a reflection of how much value you've created for other people. Yeah. Did you create value in excess of your consumption? Did you help a lot of people in some way or a small, smaller number of people in some big way? You know, what it, what's in your wake, right? And what did you do because of the person you've become? That's what it's really about. And, um, you know, again, like probably a lot of your listeners and, you know, a lot of young people are thinking, how do I build a business and make big bucks and, you know, maybe exit, maybe, you know, retire early, and, you know, and go to a beach somewhere and live in a big house and, you know, all this kind of thing. And, and, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. Um, but um, the people that really um, most fulfilled in the end are the people that understand that it's inside, it's internal. If your locus of, you know, uh, success, if you're center of success is outside you, you, you're in trouble. Those are the people that get depressed and anxiety and, you know, and commit suicide one day because, you know, the, the outside world didn't, you know, go their way. Um, it's, it's internal success and fulfillment is, is inside. Yeah. And it comes from character and discipline and, and using what's inside you to create value for other people. Yeah, there's one of my favorite books is by Daniel Pink, the book Drive. And he says that there's two types of reward systems. There's extrinsic and intrinsic. One of the things that he said in that book that I've heard, I've listened to a million times, is just it, I always think about it as purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Those are the three things that set apart intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic, which is the carrot and the stick, right? Because to what your point is, is like, yeah, only want to get that big house, only want to get that big thing, only get that private jet. And then you get, you get those things, you get those things. And then you realize that those material possessions aren't really the biggest thing. You know, I remember when I was younger years ago, I really wanted this car. 
it was, you know, at the time when the Tesla first was hot and the whole thing, it was this big thing. And I remember getting it. I was like, when I get this Tesla, I'm going to be really, really happy. And I was, you know, I was in my twenties or whatever. And I got that and I'm driving home this, you know, supercar that all, all my friends, you know, wanted right at. And it was an empty moment for me. And I was just feeling like super sad. Like I got this thing, but now that doesn't mean anything. Right. You know? So, but again, it's to your point is you don't know until you know, right? So to the point you were saying about the, the younger folks is like, until they've felt and experienced that or received that, they don't know what that's like. So I think there's interesting. And one thing I will say is uh, that list of 20,000 people that follow your thing daily, I think it just went up by about two and then probably hopefully you guys are going to sign up as well. Put in the show notes. Yeah, but. Thinkdaily.com. Yeah. So I yeah. want to move us into a different part of the story. You, what we would consider both a pitfall and an aha moment. You talked before about young people want to make the big bucks, exit, you know, go retire off and on an island or not work or do whatever. You had a little bit of an exit where investors had started to buy out your dealers and things went uh, a little sideways for you for a little bit. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and share those that story? And like, because I think everybody, many, I'd say 95% of the people we've had on this show have had an exit where they have sold a company. The last, last interview we had, the guy sold six companies. Um, I think that's sort of like the theme is that you build a company, you build a great company, you invent something, and then you exit it for millions of dollars, hopefully. That's that conventional wisdom that you like to ignore. Yeah. Here you are with, you know, I think, did you say 25, 35 businesses? 34. Yeah. Um, and obviously you ha I'd imagine you have exited some of them, but with your, with your, with your baby, with basement systems, um, you had some issues with private equity. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, so let me fill in the listeners because uh, there's some some gaps so they understand. So I started in basement waterproofing business and I started um, a dealer network in basement waterproofing. So I started developing some products that I thought were better that would give us a competitive advantage and uh, solve problems, save time, so forth. And so I started calling uh, other basement waterproofing contractors around the country. Hey, would you know I have some cool products? Would you like to be a dealer for me? And so I started building this dealer network and we built, you know, that was 1990. So it was a long time ago. And we built, the, you know, the, the, the biggest network of basement waterproofing contractors. And, and we not only sold them products, but we helped them with sales and marketing and, and uh, leadership and um, accounting and recruiting and service and production and uh, systems and, and software. And the whole thing was, you know, very much like a franchise. I mean, we, we, we gave them um, a roadmap to follow that was successful. And we weren't as good as we are today in the beginning, of course, but- How old were you when you did it, when you started it? Uh, I was 20, um, I was 25 when I, 26 when I started my dealer network, yeah. And um, then we did the same thing with crawl spaces and with uh, basement finishing and building dealer networks with, uh, and mostly we make money selling products. That's what, how we make money. So we ship 120 pallets of material a day out of our warehouse, right? We have a nine building campus in Seymour, Connecticut. Um, we're the largest employer in Seymour, Connecticut, largest taxpayer in Seymour, Connecticut. And um, so then we did the same thing in home energy conservation and now roofing and gutters. Um, and um, and uh, I partnered with a junk uh, uh, franchise, uh, Junk Luggers with uh, Josh Cohen. Um, so we ha this whole thing collectively is called Contractor Nation. And we have a uh, internet marketing agency, actually just marketing agency online and offline that has 120 people uh, involved. And uh, we do marketing for all of our dealers. And um, so it's a, it's a big organization. And, um, you know, I got to be good friends with my, my dealers. And um, so one day, a uh, private equity guy comes in and partners with one of my dealers, and he takes notice of what what we got going. And I said, I, I'm not interested in selling. So what does he do? Um, he says, all right, I'm going to get money together, and I'm going to buy your customers, and I'm going to become their new supplier. And he creates cheap knockoff products, and he buys our dealers. And so I, I get these phone calls every few months. Hey, 
Lair, I, I love you. I thanks for all you've done for me and my family for over the last 22 years, but I took the money and uh, I'm out. And so uh, this this private equity, well, this guy and this private equity buddies uh, basically were stealing my life's work. And, uh, you know, I was open because I didn't have contracts that said they couldn't do that. I mean, you know, so many years ago, who would have thought? I mean, we, we jackhammer, you know, we put some pumps in. I mean, you know, like who would ever thought that this would ever happen, right? But now- These are dealers that you picked up in your 20s. I read a little bit about your story. You were driving around to cities to meet contractors as a young man and just selling people. Yeah, I mean, I had no money and I would desperate, right? So, so I'd put some product in the back of my S10 pickup truck and drive to Michigan to meet a guy, you know, to try to get a customer, right? And so that turned into, okay, Every one of these dealers that I had, I grew them from either zero or close to zero to, you know, they grew to be 10 million, 20 million, 30, 40 million, even $50 million companies using my products and my marketing and my messaging and my pro processes and everything, everything that I taught them. So without me, they were nothing. But then they took the money and sold out, right? So, um, you know, I, I was it was it was a, a big a big hit it's you know, an activist takeover but from a private equity perspective and and without actually trying to take over your business but actually just undercut you that's 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 pretty that's a certain that's a, that's a certain kind of private equity we talk about that there's a different type of private equity I think the metaphor I read that you you may or might have referenced as locusts yeah, the private equity are like locusts sweep, has sweeping across America, buying anything and, and everything. You know, so selling a company is easy. Somebody tells me to sell their company. Okay, big whoop. You know, you gave up. You know, that's how I look at it. But, uh, but okay, so. Um, uh, quitter. <laughs> I'm not a quitter. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so, and this comes at a time. I mean, three biggest challenges in my life, big hits were uh, my house burned down to the ground. And uh, and then when we got it, and then this private equity firm started their attack, and uh, which lasted for years, I, I guess, and it's kind of over now. They tried to burn your other house down. And then, um, so my, I lost my home, my life's work, and my wife filed for divorce. So like- In what span of time? Um, in uh, probably four years. So, you know. Um, you got a strong chin. I'm not a quitter, right? And, um, you know, all these things were not anything that I did. Um, I, I have, um, you know, been get up every day and I do my very best. So, I mean, if I had uh, abused my customers or, you know, um, you know, it would be maybe I'd think about it differently, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, but all these things happen. So, um, so anyway, uh, so I decided to fight fire with fire. So I said, I'm going to buy my dealers too. And today we own, you know, 26 or partner with 26. Uh, we own some, we partner with others of our own dealers in, you know, 24 states or something. And, um, and I wouldn't keep doing it if it didn't work so damn well, you know, uh, I partner with them and we're able to, you know, improve their operations and their top line and their bottom line and, and so forth, uh, so much in short order by doing what we know how to do that they, we try to teach them, but some of them learned it well, some of them didn't execute well, and some of them didn't have the ambition. Some of them were afraid, you know, do you think? So, Larry, if, if the private equity jerks didn't go and do what they did, do you think you would have discovered and moved into that partnership dealer model? Um, like, w w would some say that um, that moment sort of ignited a, a new opportunity that you wouldn't have previously? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, remember what I said before, if you quit while you're down, you're a loser, right? If I just stood there and said, 25 years, I built this and... I'm going to let these guys take it from me. I don't know what else to do. Poor me, you know. Um, then, you know, I lose, right? Um, but I didn't. I, I, you know, never quit, 
right? And um, so the, uh, from those three three disasters, uh, I now have my business is just way, it's just fantastic. It's, it's bigger, better, more dimensions. We're having a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's it's just great. Um, and in so many ways, um, uh, I rebuilt my house. It's way better than ever. You know, it took three and a half years, but uh, it's a it's amazing home to to wake up in every day and to inspire the future. Did right? you lose the marbles? I had a I, I to restart the marbles. Yes, I had to get a new jar and uh, yeah, count all the marbles in again. I lost everything right to the basement floor. So. But anyway, and then, you know, not my the journals, which were n- so it- not the journals. Yeah. So that's a different story. So I saved, uh, I made copies of my journals when I filled one and I put them in the safe in a big gun safe in the basement. And uh, we recovered the safe and busted it open uh, at, with great effort. And um, we, uh, they were all smoky, water, stinky, you know, the journals. But I, I dried each page and copied each smoky page, had them copied, and so I didn't lose my journals to that point. Why did Um, those journals hold so much significance to you, Larry? Well, um, you know, what you know is, um, to me, you know, I am my wealth. I mean, that's what people need to understand. You are your wealth. What's inside you, your character and what you know and your experiences are your wealth. Right. And that's what I'm saying. You have nothing to lose. It's it's about who you become, not what you get. What you get is transitory. Right. I mean, you buy the car. I mean, OK, whatever. I mean, these days, a new car doesn't even excite me. I could buy any car that I want. And I, I've, I've owned Corvettes my whole life. You know, I've said it. You know, one Corvette. I want to convert you to a European guy. I think that's conversation. Yeah. That, well, OK. But that's probably not going to happen. But <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, things are great. But, you know, my. My personal mission statement now is a, an extraordinary life of shared experiences, shared experiences. And so I take people with me, right? And um, Love that. But, and, and in my divorce, you know, I, I realized after, it was the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. And after, you know, just really struggling through it, because I'm not a quitter, right? I would have never suggested this. And I realized, you know what, it was for the better. And uh, and now I, I got remarried last July, and I'm married to a beautiful, right. incredible woman who makes me so happy, and we're so happy together. And I have a, a, two new kids that live in the house, and they they keep me young, and they're great kids. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's amazing. So the the story for people out there is in order to have a breakthrough, something's got to break. You you need to make an opening in your life for something new to come in. Sometimes, you know, you're, you're so invested with your time or, you know, uh, your commitment and your relationship, your sunk cost biases, right, of all different kinds, and you would never give them up. But then change is forced upon you, and it, it feels like a disaster, but... If you just hang in there and you keep being a good person and treating people well and you keep going, something amazing is going to happen, you know. So uh, from from the ashes comes the rainbow. You know, it's it's just an amazing thing. Yeah. No, indeed. I like. I have to tell you, meeting you for the first time, and I feel like I know you because I, I see your picture. I love. I don't know why, but I have this like crazy love for the clipper magazines and all the the coupon uh um flyers that come in the mail so i see you all the time because i always always look at them um you should thank his direct mail company <laughs> direct advantage right yeah, yeah all those guys no i'm saying like whatever you do no, for years mail, thank them. <laughs> for years, so i so you, you're you're front and center in all these ads right connecticut basement systems larry janeski you got your signature on there i could like i could i could redraw it like I, I know it by heart. I did. Um, did you? Yeah. Um, and 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 so it's very sort of. You're very sort of outgoing in advertising, but then here, you've got a certain air about you. You're very subdued, very quiet spoken, but then there's like these glimmers of excitement and smiles that come out of you, and it's like such a, 
it, it's like such an interesting sort of onion of who you are. Um, and then, and then the motocross and the things that you do, like so far, uh, I, I, I don't know, even know where I'm going with this, but it, there's, there's just something interesting about you. Like you talked about your son being an introvert. You almost feel like an introvert, but then I see these moments and sparks that come out from you and this, this sort of, uh, depth and complexity yeah. for a curse to me. Right. Yeah. That, that's what I'm trying. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, this is really fun. It's been so well, fun so far. So. You know, I, I'm a do it first, talk about it later guy. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I tell my, um, I tell my classes, I do sales training, I do leadership training, but in my sales training, I tell them, look, when you go in and you do a presentation, you're doing a show, right? You're doing a show. And, and the results you get, the world says, I like your show this much, or I like your show this much, you know? And I tell them when I was first dating my, my wife, uh, and, uh, this was about, uh, three, three and a half years ago, we, we go to Broadway and I want to impress her, right? So I got these tickets online to this show and uh, I paid like a fortune for these tickets. So I was like, Jesus, a Broadway costs a lot. I haven't been there in you know years and years, but wow. So we, we walk in, it's a snowy day and the, the play was Hades Town, right? And I honestly, I would never really heard of it, but I had great ratings, so okay. So the usher says, I give him my tickets. He says, okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir, this way. And he leads us right up to front row center, right? Front row center. I'm like, oh, this is going good. <laughs> really? She's sitting there. We're front row center. Like we could touch the, 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 the front of the stage, right? So during the play, which was amazing, the leading uh, actress, she comes out playing a leading role and um, she sings her sad song because in, invariably, you know, there's always a love story involved and she sings her sad song about he, you know, went away and stuff. And she's at the edge of the stage. And if we were in the back row, we never would have seen this. She's singing her sad song and she's crying, right? The tears are rolling out of her eyes and they drip off her chin, right? And of course, what are we doing? We're crying too, right? Because... You know, emotion is contagious. And I thought to myself, this girl has done this play hundreds of times before. She knows the end of the story, but she put herself in state and she did her job so well, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, when you're a salesperson, I mean, we've got to be able to get along with all the different personality styles of the prospects that we meet right so you know i'm a director thinker and you know uh someone else might be you know a, a, a relator or socializer and you know i've got to get along with those people so i gotta change to be able to get rapport with a wide variety of people so i, I teach this and so it's not natural right it's not i'm an uh, an introvert Right. I go behind the scenes. My happy place is I'm, I'm by myself. I'm studying. I'm doing my work. Right. By myself. No interruptions. Right. And so a bit like Tanner, if you will, like Tanner. Right. And but when I'm doing sales training, when I'm doing leadership training. Right. I got a job to do. When I'm here at the podcast, I got, you know, I got I got a point to get across. So I'm going to step out of state right? My natural state and I'm going to get the job done. Then I'm, you know, when I'm on my own time, I can be me. Right. So, um, anyway, it's, oh, that makes sense. yeah. Well, it's like that, it's like that book, the man of a thousand faces or is that the, the one? So he and I are introverts. You'd guess that you would know it about him if you knew him for as long as I've known. But for me, I'm the show pony. I'm always on stage. I'm always doing the things I have to do. I'm the biz dev guy, sales guy. And then recently, my wife, um, huh? I love that you said show pony because I immediately just like imagine you riding a unicorn, and I'm not gonna lie, like, <laughs> maybe it's the water. We wouldn't in the water ever, <laughs> but yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, the about a unicorn, just like. Oh, no. But the uh, so so the other day, my wife sent me a message, and she had said um, that one of her good friends follows me on social media, and he's been sharing my videos and my content with his wife, who wants to start a new company or or is leaning into her hobby to become a new business. And he was like, uh, he said something along the lines of it's really hard for her because she's an introvert. And then my wife texted him. She sent me the text message string and she said, well, 
you should know that my husband is an introvert as well, uh, that he does all the things he does, um, mainly because he doesn't care about people's opinions of him and that he, he doesn't allow people to influence him with their insecurities and their fears and their biases. Um, but at the end of the day, he goes and he waits for everybody to get out of the living room or out of his office so that he can be by himself to recharge. And that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the key to what I've now started to research, uh, which is this four types of introverts. And, and it sounds like we are social introverts. So we're able to do the things that need to be done to get our points across to, to, to get the job done. But then we have to go and for yours is your work and your journaling and the thing and the learning and things that you do for mine is it can be a variety of things. Um, so it, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting the more you dive into that. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I recognize that I need to do things for people and through people and with people. Okay. So I, I, I'm, I'm able to, you know, get that done. I mean, that, that's important to me. Like my goals are what I work on every single day. And I know that people are, you know, uh, obviously, you know, uh, without them, I have no goals. Right. I mean, if you're alone, what, what are your goals? Right. I want to, I want to unpack that. So rewinding back, you know, to a point you were listening to the motivational tapes in your car, even got made fun of a bit by some of your peers and whatnot. Fast forward to 2016, you're the founder and primary instructor and you start the school of entrepreneurship, right? I want to talk about that. The, the metaphor for me of that, uh, actor on the stage with the tears when you were in the front row with your now wife. Um, Josh Cohen from Junk Luggers told us a story um, on one of our episodes where, where we had him on. And that's how we came to get to have this conversation with you today, which we're really grateful for. He described a moment where you were doing a guided meditation with the group and he just lost it and just broke into tears like that actor on the stage, but he was not putting a part on it. It was just, it came out of him. Can you maybe share a little bit about, A, what is the School of Entrepreneurship? I think we all know now why you did it based on your personal mission statement, but what is the School of Entrepreneurship? And can you maybe take the audience through that moment I'm talking about? Because I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about with the Josh story, if if I had to guess, right? So, okay. If you want to get wealthy, here's the formula. <laughs> Work once, get paid forever. So... You know, if I'm doing something transactional, if I'm answering the phone, if I'm, you know, selling, if I'm servicing a customer, that's not leverageable. That's not scalable, right? I only have 24 hours in a day. Um, I can't, um, you know, I have to feed myself, sleep, you know, eat. Uh, I have to uh, spend time with the family and so forth. There's only so many hours left in the day for me to work. Build the fastest motorcycle on the planet. Well, <laughs> and so if, uh, if I'm become a workaholic to get more done, if that's my strategy, if I get paid for my time, then um, if I want to make more, I begin to crowd out the other parts of my life, right? And my relationships suffer and my health and my sleep suffers and so forth. So you've got to figure out how to leverage you what you know. First, you got to learn it, right? So there's, you know, there's the 20 years that you learn to be the best, right? And then you can leverage your time through video, through, you know, books, through, um, you know, courses and, and uh, training programs in your company and so forth. So that, you know, I, I travel, you know, like, uh, where was I? I was in Seattle last week and uh, visiting a dealer and, you know, the people are, the employees of the company are coming up to me saying, oh, wow, you know, it's great to meet you. You know, I, I've been listening to your videos, you know, your audios and, and, and watching your videos and thanks for training me. And I, I never met this person, right? So uh, if you're really good at something in, in business, you should be able to train other people how to do it and you should bottle it, right? So um, the critical variable in any business is leadership. If the business will never outperform the leader, right? It's never going to do better than the leader. And so that's why as a leader, you know, the, the day you start your business, you print your business cards. Okay. You just put yourself at the top of a pyramid and however big that pyramid might get underneath you, you're at the top. And so in order to get that pyramid bigger underneath you, you need to c 
continue to grow, continue to learn, continue to be uh, a better person, continue to learn how to be a better leader. You don't have to do everything, but you have to get there, you know, the things that need to be done through other people, right? And to recognize what they are and to be good at building a team of people that do those things. Um, so I recognize that, you know, many contractors who were my dealers, uh, you know, they just became a contractor out of necessity, needed to make some money, but they weren't good leaders. No one ever taught them good leadership. So I created a school of entrepreneurship and I did live trainings every six weeks for three and a half years and had people fly in from all over the North America to my classes and I recorded everything. And uh, I also did uh, out of class recordings, you know, into the camera and, uh, and I wrote all the content and basically it's a, it's a university level course for uh, leading a business, right? A, a home improvement, home repair business in particular, but it, you know, there's so much in there for any business. And um, about half the content is about you. It was about the leader and improving the leader's thinking. And the other half is about um, uh, sales and marketing and accounting and recruiting and production and service and appointment center and so forth. And I divided it up uh, after the course was over because I'm never doing it again live. Leverage, right? I uh, put it together in an online platform called uh, this thesoe.com, T-H-E-S-O-E.com. And you basically, you know, if you watched a 12-minute video a day, you, um, you know, take you three and a half years to get through. It's, and the goal is not to get through it as fast as possible. The goal is to, you know, to grow personally and improve your leadership abilities. Um, and... Um, it's been wildly successful, uh, has made a huge impact on so many people. And, um, you know, again, I go back to that example where we send our kids to college not knowing what they're going to do. It's like speculation, right? I, you know, we, they're going to study X. Like my, my youngest daughter would, became the first Janeski to go to college. She studied, she changed her major after one year. No, I don't want to do that. And then she studied something for four more years, so five years of college, and then she didn't even do that uh, yet. Maybe she will, but she hasn't yet. And, you know, that's a familiar story, right? But yet we have chosen our business as adults, as the parent who earned that money to send that kid to college so that they can learn more about what they want to do. We know what we want to do, and yet we don't invest as much in our own education, right, so that we can get better. Because let's face it, if you can get, two years results uh, in one year, 10 years results in five years, right? Or 50 years results in 20 years. It's exponential, not linear. That is just an amazing thing, right? That would make a huge difference in your life, you know? I mean, you're, I was listening to Brian Tracy one time and he talked about, somebody asked him, what's the most important you know, piece of advice you ever got of all the things you've learned. And Brian Tracy's like a walking encyclopedia, right? And he says, well, he was at a, um, actually he was the one asked a, a, a trainer, uh, Kip Kopmeyer was the trainer's name. Kip Kopmeyer said, Mr. Kopmeyer, what's the most, of all these things you've taught in this seminar, what's the most important thing you've ever learned? He said, you have to learn from other people. You'll never live long enough to learn it all yourself. Great advice. And so every day I, I spend time in the morning and, and at different times throughout the day, but mostly in the morning, uh, reading, I'm listening to audio books, listening to the podcast, right? And I'm just learning and there's always something, even a bad book has some good stuff in it. Um, but some books, I mean, I just, it's like I'm rewriting the whole book, right? And yeah, but, always a nugget. I feel like Jay-Z said, yeah. <laughs> cloud thread, you know, broken cloud thread two times a day. Yeah, right, yeah. Two, twice a day. I, I, For me, I think everybody, every business, every tool, every software has a nugget, and then the rest is all the same shit. Um, you asked a question in the beginning before we started the show, who is this show for? Who's the audience? And I think first and foremost, it's for, it's for Pete and m myself. Like, we love these conversations because... 
we've we've been entrepreneurs. I mean, we started. He was 24 years old. I was 26 years old when we started our first company, um, and he, he, he's different. Pete, Pete crushes books. He's a, a rabid reader and learner. I I, re, I learn in a very different way. Um, I went to college as an escape, not mm -hmm. to learn, not to become something, not to get a degree. Uh, it was for a whole different reason. And I would answer the question that you asked earlier. Now that we've got the cameras on. This show for me is for the 19 year old version of myself that had no fucking clue where he was going and nobody like the, the no one told him he could do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, I want, I didn't have mentors growing up. My mentors were like, I would turn on the television and I'd be like, let me watch Steve jobs, give this Apple presentation. And like, I don't know this guy, right? I'm just watching it. It's inspiring. Or, you know, I'm trying to get my hands on a book or a Google search or IRC chat room before that was cool. And so that's, I would say who this, this is for is like, it's creating that sense of learning because the, the problem I think with answers, Larry, is that you have to have the questions or else you can't find the answers. And I think you have to sort of turn the antennae on to be able to absorb that information. So I want to, I want to unpack the one question on school of entrepreneurship, which Bo, it's beautiful that you're doing that. How'd you meet Josh Cohen? How did he end up in the seat of one of these training programs and then have that visualization moment? Because that to me, I think is is an interesting unlock that I'm curious about. I think the audience is going to be curious about because when he told that story on his episode, which came a few before you, it was a really prolific moment. So maybe you can take the audience through that. Well, um, I, I, Josh Cohen came to me. Um, I, I Honestly, I, I, I'm, he came to me and uh, said, hey, I've been following you and uh, I need some advice, um, you know, um, business advice, you know, I feel a little stuck. And so uh, he came, we had lunch one day in our cafeteria in our building. And uh, I said, hey, you know, let's talk more. And um, and shortly after we, you know, became partners. And um, and uh, in my school of entrepreneurship, I, I, I don't know exactly what, you know, visualization technique, uh, which I, um, I'm not a big like meditator, but visualization, you know, and just having a clear picture of where you want to go, if you want to call that meditation. But, um, um, yeah, so we're just envisioning, uh, the future. Uh, I, we, we've done exercises where you look at your past. How did you come to think this way? You know, maybe it was something there, um, but he, you, you can't be one kind of leader and another kind of person, right? You're the same. And so if you have problems with your thinking that result from your past, the result from your experiences, your trauma, your, your education, uh, your family relationships, your, your, your current relationships, you need to fix those to be the best person that you could be. And so that's, you know, probably what our focus was at that moment in the school. And, and we revisit that, uh, you know, a fair amount um, so that you can become the kind of person you need to be to attract the results that you say that you want. So you're fixing the basements and people, not just in their houses. <laughs> really great analogy. <laughs> wow. How's it going? <laughs> Well, you know, this is leadership training for my dealers and, and we opened it up to outside of the network, outside of our network contractors. And today it's open for any business owner. You can subscribe at the SOE.com and, uh, you know, and get started. And um, I want to buy a subscription for the pool guy that I dealt with last year. Great guy. Terrible, terrible business name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, talked about that before. Home improvement lends itself to this, you know, solopreneur and, you know. They get they get overwhelmed very quickly and I know. it's it's not easy. That's why he's still there. That's yeah. why he got paid. But I was in the same I was very very disappointed. I just said communicate. That's it. The biggest thing I could tell every contractor in the world today is just I don't care how small you are, if you got one person or a thousand to work for you, just communicate to your clients. There's um I couldn't agree with you more. Um the title of one of your books really struck me. Because the only other time I heard it, Iron Sharpens Iron, the only other time I heard that was from someone I deeply care for and respect. He's a really talented guy on our team, been with you for a long time. What does Iron Sharpens Iron mean to you? And walk us through that. 
Well, th that's a story about how my son and I, um, we went to, we're, we're avid motocross racers, um, and I, I've been riding with him, you know, from a when he was five years old. When he was, I think, uh, 10 months old, we got this little four-wheeler, and when he was uh, uh, two, he wanted to drive it, so I'd be sitting on it, and he'd be driving it. He's two years old, right? His feet were like a foot from the foot pegs. I mean, they were... <laughs> And then when he was two years and 10 months old, I got off and had him in first gear just driving around the yard. I, I could have got arrested for that, but... Um, um, we won't call DC after him. But uh, he, so when he was five, I got him on a dirt bike. And anyway, we rode together for years. And then um, we went on a recreational tour in uh, Baja and learned about the Baja 1000. We were like, what is the Baja 1000? What's well, the longest off-road race in the world? And um, my son decided you know, that we should enter. So we entered as a two-man team in 2015, not knowing what was going to happen. You know, we had some uh, advice from a chase team that was very experienced. Uh, uh, and we entered the race in our class. Uh, it's a sportsman motorcycle class. They have four wheel, you know, all kinds of classes. And um, there was 10 teams in our class. And I, I brought a video team from my company. So we have a video department. I brought a couple of video guys and we chronicled this effort. I don't know why I did that. I, I, I thought oh, that would be cool. Yeah, I love it. And um, well, it turns out through very dramatic fashion through, okay, we're, we're doing okay. We're doing great. Oh, we're, he's missing in the night. Cause this is a 1000 mile long race, a little more, a little less each year. And it takes approximately 30 hours. I mean, I've been in the race now for as long as 50 hours uh, wow. on a dirt bike um, by myself. But any, anyway, um, I'll get to that. So um, this is a long race. You start at, at dawn and you go all through the day. And, and uh, actually, you start at maybe 2 a.m. It's dark when you start. You, the sun comes up. You go this, you know, all day. The sun goes down all night. The sun comes up again. And you're going during the day. And hopefully you finish. And your chances of finishing are not good. Um, but anyway, we won the race and we made a movie about it. It's called Into the Dust and it's on YouTube. And it just became this like uh, the most popular movie about desert racing, uh, motorcycle racing ever. And it's got 5 million views. Uh, it's a 90 minute movie. And, um, and so... The, the next year, my son decided, all right, uh, he says he, he's going to enter the Ironman class. And that's by yourself because with a team, typically a team of on a dirt bike, you have maybe five riders. And one guy will go, you know, 200 miles, give it to the next guy. He goes 200 miles, you know, five hours or so. Next guy, he goes four hours. Next guy, he goes five hours and like that, right? Well, Ironman is solo. And oh. you, you do the whole the, thing yourself, the whole thing yourself. So the physical demand is just incredible. And it, and it gets exponential as you go, because as your body wears down, you, you got to keep going and going. It's just harder and harder and harder and harder. And only, only 11 people have ever finished this race at the time that we started, that we try, started trying. Well, he said he wanted to do Ironman. So I said, well, you know, I'm 52 years old. And I lost my teammate here. He's going to do Ironman class. So what the hell? I'll do it too. All right. So in 2016, we raced it. And, um, it, you know, it's very dramatic, right? And, and that's why I wrote the book about it. We made a movie, Into the Dust 2, about that race. My son, through great effort, finished. I got hurt in mile 200 and uh, got whiplash Ooh. and hurt my neck uh, real bad. And I struggled through to mile 600 and I tapped out. So then the next year, we have to go back. I, I'm not going to quit. I'm not a quitter. I already told you that. I'm not going to let the desert beat me. So I go back, and then Tanner says, well, if you go on back, I'll go back. I don't want to go back because it's pain and suffering, but I'll go back because you're going back. So that year, um, he is deathly allergic to peanuts and ate some hot sauce at a restaurant with peanut oil in it. And was in anaphylactic shock 30, 30 hours before the race. Had to get him to the hospital. Oh, man. And so we started the race, um, and he was leading the race for uh, 
a couple hundred miles in, in the Ironman class, and I was way behind him. And uh, he tapped out at mile 607. And um, I saw him when I came through there and, um, you know, checked to see if he's okay. Uh, checked feels he's okay not finishing the race, right? Um, so I go on and I freaking missed a pit and I, and I ran out of gas at mile 643. And I was stuck for seven hours. And the, the race was 1,134 miles that year. And I had a seven-hour cushion. I blew it all waiting for gas because I wow. ran out of gas. And I, it was my mistake. I missed the gas pit in all the excitement with him tapping out and stuff. I got gas, got going. I got to mile 831, and I, I tapped out. And um, so that's Into the Dust 2, the movie, okay? Into the Dust 3, sorry. So then the next year, I don't quit. Right, I go back. Tanner decided not to race. This pain and suffering. He's not going to do this again. Put himself through this again. So I go back, and I had perfect conditioning, perfect planning, perfect race, and I become the oldest finisher, and only the uh, I think the twenty twentieth finisher of this race ever. And um, uh, Tanner and I became the only father and son to ever finish the Baja One Thousand. And I finished second place in the points that year. I became only the second Ironman ever to finish every mile of the season. There's four races in the season. Uh, and so we made Into the Dust 4, that m movie, about about that. And so all those Into the Dust movies are all, you know, every racer studies our movies now to understand how to carry out the race because they're really authentic. They're not overproduced. They show one team's, you know, highs, lows, you know, agony of defeat, mistakes, you know, things that we learned and everything and everybody studies them. And when we go down to Baja at race time, we got another race in a few weeks, everybody knows us. And uh, so I wrote the book, Iron Sharpens Iron, which, you know, he made me better. I never would have raced that race if he didn't just maybe through ignorance, maybe through, you know, boldness and young brashness right he entered and i went with him and i stuck with it right and i became his wingman he became my inspiration and i his and uh so it's just you know an incredible thing and and then he went on to i i raced several more uh i've been in the baja 1000 every year for eight years now and, and um uh last year he was against the the, class, the motorcycle classes get bigger and bigger and bigger because of our movies. People come from all over the world. And uh, there was 22 in the Ironman class, which is huge. I mean, you got to be crazy just to enter. And they came from all over the world, the best guys that had finished and the guys that had won it before. And, and Tanner's there, and he says, i got to win. He, his best finish was second in, in the Ironman class. He did, I, I'm going to win this thing. But now he sees all these competitors show up. And uh, so he says, well, I'm going to do my best. So he goes out there, and he's in, out of 22, he's in, um, he works his way up to second place. Then he, at mile 360, he sees a guy down in front of him all crumpled up. And uh, he knows what that feels like because he's been there too. Yeah. And so it turns out there's a rock camouflage, same color as the sand, sticking up about 18 inches. And it's in the shadows, a mottled shadow, and uh, you can't see it. And he hits the same rock this guy hit. And uh, as he's slowing down, thankfully, and uh, so he gets, smashes his face into the ground. The back bike lands on his back, hurts his back. It takes about five minutes to get himself together and and um, and, and and pick up his bike. And he, and he goes up to the other rider, and that guy is just as hurt as you can get without dying. He hit that rock at 60 miles an hour. He his forks collapsed on impact and then bent in the compressed position and never, you know, came out again. I mean, he broke both arms on impact, broke his back, his his femur, his hip, uh, seven ribs, and two arms with bones sticking out. Oh, my God. And Tanner sees this, right? And so uh, he prevents him from getting run over by other vehicles coming around that turn, and, uh, and he... Tanner carried a sat phone, and not many riders carry a sat satellite phone. 
So he calls in to our team. Our team calls them, uh, the um, calls for help. And uh, they say, all right, we got a UTV coming in there to pick the guy up. And Tanner says, no, you need a helicopter. So they call the helicopter. Helicopter comes and um, the medic jumps out, looks at the guy and tells the guy, the pilot, shut it down. He needs help. So uh, pilot, medic, and Tanner get this guy, you know, he's a bag of bones, right? And they get him on the stretcher. They get him into the chopper. Finally, you know, chopper takes off and Tanner's sitting there. He lost an hour and 25 minutes, right? And now he, he's hurt. He's, he's so rattled, yeah. right, by what can happen when you are racing for the win. And um, so he, he gets going and he found the flow state. You know what that is. Of course. Right? I found the flow state and he, he managed to stay in flow state for the entire rest of the race. Like an amazing performance. So he was an hour and 20 minutes behind. Everyone else was, he was passing guys with authority, like from, oh, there's all other classes, right? There's all kinds of vehicles on the course, but he is just not stopping at his pit, you know, you know, driving by the pit, seeing his crew and just giving a thumbs up and going or stopping and, you know, jamming some food in his face and, and, and going. And, um, at the finish after, um, uh, you know, it was 30, 30 hours ish. He was in second place in the race and he pulls up on the podium and they're interviewing the, the guy right in front of him that just pulled up on the podium a minute earlier was an Ironman and they're interviewing him on the podium and they say, so you're the first Ironman across the finish line. And the guy points behind him and said, no, he got me. And he points to Tanner. And so everybody on the radio, the chatter was how Tanner stopped to save this guy, right? Even though he was in contention to win, right? And so he finished one minute behind the leader, even after stopping for an hour and 20 minutes. But that guy, they start the bikes every 30 seconds. Tanner started in, um, in third. That guy started in seventh. Wow. So, so Tanner won straight up while stopping to save this guy's life by a minute. And, you know, talk about a proud moment, right? Yeah. yeah. But then the next day they gave, when the official results came out, they gave Tanner an hour and 25 minute um, Good Samaritan credit. And he won by, you know, almost an hour and a half. So right now my son is the best long distance desert rider in the world. That's so awesome. Son. Amazing. Yeah. Sorry for the long story. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I want everybody that on the show, after they listen to that, they're going to go to YouTube and they're going to start watching your movies. That's, yeah. That's incredible. Into the Dust. You do what? have the show notes. What? You do everything. It's so big. Level 11. I love it. The video. Level 11. I love it. Yeah. I remember going, was, uh, go, let's go back, right? 16, it got to be 15, 16 years ago when we went to the treehouse, right? Yeah, easily. Yeah. We had just started our company. We were good. We were in Connecticut. We were doing good business. Well, you know what it was. So th this is a fun, this. I'll, I'll keep it short, but um, back in the day, SEO was like legendary, and it's you know nowadays it's just, there's it's sort of evolved into a lot of other stuff. But there was a a couple of keywords that you guys couldn't rank mm -hmm. top top number one for, and me and this and this guy who was really good in SEO, um, we're both coders. Yeah, Ross. Yeah, Enrique Ross was his name. Um, I wonder how he's doing. I'll reach out to him. But um, we, so you, Treehouse or whatever it was called, I think I, I think it was Treehouse. No, it was Treehouse. Yeah, you know, no, yeah, I just remember in it. In the office. No, but I'm saying, I think the, the, the name, right? So I had reached out to us at, at Digital Surgeons and because you guys couldn't rank for this keyword and you were just trying to chase it, chase it. And, and everything you wanted to rank for at the time, it was, you know, like back to number one race, right? Like you clearly, you guys were, uh, you've embedded that performance mindset to everything you do clearly. And I remember like they were pissed that they couldn't get above three in the, in the SERPs, right? And nowadays the SERPs have changed a lot, but yeah. we were doing some, some smart stuff, you know, playing by the book, but you, we just, we were just above you for this one small little, it was a small little contractor client that we had. And we just, we were like, every time they would bump up, 
And Rick Ad wrote a script and we were checking and like every time you'd go up, we were like, all right, we'll do this thing. And, we, and we'd go up again. And it was, it was funny. It was like our own little race just but I, wins I, action. I just remember, remember yeah. the concept of Treehouse and then walking in and we're seeing the office yeah. and seeing the, the cafeteria and the trees. And I, and I was like, oh, you, you do see, you, you do. And the bike. You, what I'd like to say bikes. about people like you, and, I, and I'd like to think of myself as like a, a younger, um, uh, or sh- excuse me, less experienced uh, uh, version of you is that as subdued as you are, in your speech patterns, you overdo everything. You bring video cameras, you make movies, you write books, you got big businesses. You, I mean, you're a, you're an exceptional person. I wouldn't use that well, word subdued though. For me, wh- how you occur to me, and this is what I love about the the duality that David and I bring to this the show and why I would never want to do it by myself is what I s- hear and see in you is humility and a humbleness because at the end of the day, the results speak for themselves. You don't need to be loud and proud and brash, right? Like a lot of times the loud and proud and brash person is the one that doesn't have the most impressive stuff. That's what I was talking about. When I say subdued, there's a duality yeah. there because it, you do it, you yeah. do it and you do it big. It's a humble kind as long as I've, uh, as long as I've heard of Larry Janeski, you've been, we've been owning that. Well, I, I can say that I've always felt like the underdog my whole life. And maybe because I was, um, you know, small, and, uh, you know, my family had no connections and no, you know, I, I, like nobody would have expected anything, you know, and, um, and, and I was, you know, the, the runt in school, you know, this freckle face, you know, 80 pound kid when, you know, the other kids had, you know, beards, you know, <laughs> and, uh, he even, you know, uh, when I was in Little League, I, I tell that story on my uh, video called From the Invisible on YouTube. It's 21 minutes, kind of my story that, um, from the invisible. But uh, I was in Little League and, um, you know, I got moved up to from the farm team to the major team uh, just because I aged out. You know, I was like, you know, and, uh, you know, I wasn't very good, you know, um, and they put me back down to farm from majors and that was like the most humiliating thing and you know the coach didn't want me basically and and uh because I, I was bad you know and in the when the yearbook comes out my they have everybody's batting average and mine is like 0.067 right I'm at the bottom it's like the most humiliating thing right but I didn't quit I didn't quit and one day um they uh, had um uh, field day and they have all these little contests and they give trophies and they had catchers throw because I was a catcher for a short time. And so they pitch you the ball, and you got to throw the ball to second base. And if you're right over the base, you get three points. If you're within a foot over here, you get two points. If you're outside this, you get, you know, one point. And if you're on the third base side, you get nothing. And if you're out here, you get nothing. So, well, they give you three, three throws, and I got three, three, three. And I beat all the best all-star catchers, right? And I was like, you know what? I, so still to this day, uh, not just from that, but I feel like, okay, all right, you're going to push me around. You're going to be a bully. You're going to be a pot shot. Okay. All right. I'll go back and I'll do my work and I will beat you. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how much effort I got to put in, you know, and oftentimes these guys have lost interest and they're onto something else. And I'm over here winning, right? Because I don't give up. Right. I've been here in business for 40 years. I could have retired many, many years ago, right? Many times over. But I'm here because I don't quit and I get better and better and better at what I do. And I'm able to do more and more things a lot easier. I have a great team that stays with me. I have great resources. And I understand that I was put here for a reason. We're all put here for a reason, right? There's there's a plan to this. And I'm, I'm not, um, like, I don't go to church, um, but I believe there's a plan here, right? Why why did you have born with some talents? He's born with some different talents. And, like, th- there's a way that this is supposed to be, right? We're supposed to help each other. And so some of us are given certain talents for building, fixing things, you know, caring for people. You're an artist, you're a mechanic, you're, you're good with words, you're good at memory. You're just kind, just being kind, you know, uh, is a talent, right? So what, what was I put here for? And then, you know, 
for me to make, pick, pick a number, like $10,000, I can make $10,000 in a short period of time. And then someone else works very hard, sweeping the street, proverbially washing dishes, whatever. And it takes them a long time to make the same amount of money. But they're working this, like they're struggling as much as me. Maybe not, you know, mentally, yeah. right? But there's effort there to wash yeah, dishes, compliance. right? Yeah. And when I go to the restaurant, I want clean dishes, right? And so that person is important in the grand scheme of things. Like to, to make this all work, we need people to do all different jobs, right? Sure. So this is my job that I have to use my talents in service to other people, right? And should I quit my job, sell my company, take the money, and become a professional consumer for the rest of my life? The way I see it, and I'm not judging anybody else, I'm just telling you my the way I see it, okay? That we have a moral and ethical responsibility to continue producing value for other people for the rest of our lives. And if you get really good at it and you have lots of resources and you're providing lots of value and benefit to a lot of people because you built a company, yeah, that's your job, okay? And how do I know we have a moral and ethical responsibility to be continue to produce? I know that because we're all consumers. So if you're taking from society, all your benefits. So you're going to be a consumer. You want to order stuff on Amazon, have it be there the next day. And you want this service. And you want to snap your fingers and say, I want this, I want that. Because you sold your company, your private equity, and you have all these millions of dollars and you're sitting on your butt doing nothing. That's wrong to me. Like, I, I, I think you need to continue to create value. Now, there's nothing wrong with selling your company and going on to doing something else. Or maybe you couldn't take it to the next level. Okay, so you exit and then you go be a founder and, you know, a uh, startup guy. You know, that's what you're calling. Okay, 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 great. But, you know, for me on my journey, I've been a contractor and what I do, and we probably should have said this in the very beginning, in a nutshell, is I help contractors succeed. That's what I do for a living. I help contractors succeed and I am one. Well, you help build contractors so contractors can build things for other people. And, I, and I'll punch that in in the intro, don't worry. Yeah. So, you know, th th that's the way I see my, uh, you know, my role in the world. And I'm no better or worse. I'm just, I'm trying to have fun. Uh, you know, extraordinary life of shared experiences. I don't want to be normal. I don't want to be average. You know, I want to, I don't want a boring days, right? I want to be doing exciting things all the time. And share them with other people. So I built the tree house and it's a, a workspace that is decked out like a tree house. And since you've been there, a lot of things have changed. We have Boomtown, which is an 1880s mining town theme. Um, we have uh, a, a 50s cafeteria. We have uh, the Forge and Anvil. It's a vintage industrial space. Um, we have a spaceship theme. Um, we have all these uh, really cool presidential rooms um, and um, this real modern section in the front of the building uh, with glass and metal and stuff. And so we have all these different environments in our building on our 35,000 square foot floor. And I want to make it fun for people, right? Share, shared experiences, right? Yeah. And just do cool things. People walk in there and they go, whoa, this is like you guys have done a great job with, you know, with this place. They go, whoa, you know, this is really cool. There's something special here, right? I feel cool. You know, I, it's fun, right, to come to work. And, you know, look, in the end, there's a utility purpose, right? We're all competing with other employers for the best employees, right? Um, but, you know, it's all, it's all part of the same thing, right? I mean, it's not like there's what you do, then there's how you do it. How you do it. Do you do it with excitement, fun? Grace, style, character, integrity, authenticity, right? Are you loyal to the people in your life? Do you share with the people in your life? Um, you know, so I think that's um, that's part of a life well lived for me. That's an amazing place for us to close. So before we ride off into the dust with Larry Janeski, um, <laughs> where do we, where do folks go to follow you? Uh, well, LarryJanesky.com. 
Um, but then there's thinkdaily.com, sign up for my daily blog. Um, and you can get, uh, you can watch Into the Dust on YouTube. You can get The Highest Calling, my book on, uh, on uh, Amazon, on Audible. The audio version of The Highest Calling is, is amazing. Um, and, uh, did you read it? Is it, did you do the voice or? Yeah, I, it's my voice. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. I always like when the author does the narration, it makes a difference for me. Yeah. Yeah. Larry, this has been awesome. Really, really good. This was exciting to have you here to 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 know your brand for as long as we've known it here in Connecticut and 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 what you've done and to just hear your stories and what you've achieved and how big you go and how humble you are has been great. Thank well, you. thank you very much. It's been an honor uh, to be here and uh, it's uh, it's all part of the journey, right? We're sharing. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Ford Obsessed. Please share this episode, subscribe, and leave a review on your podcast app. This episode was hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas from the Digital Surgeons Podcast Studio in New Haven, Connecticut. Special thanks to our AV crew, Steve Walter and Meg Olson. Forward Obsess is produced by Robert Roach. If you'd like to contact our team, visit us at forwardobsessed.com.